So welcome everybody. Um, as we've been highlighting over the um, last uh, few weeks, lifestyle is very much the way in which a person lives. And those modifiable lifestyle factors can really influence how happy or sad, healthy or sick we may be. But if changing was really easy, we'd all ultimately be really happy and healthy specimens. Um, but we're not. And so there's much more involved in change than just being aware of the things we should do and, and using willpower. And tonight I'm going to share a little bit more about that with you. So the science of behaviour change, um, there is a science behind it. And if we think about it a little bit more scientifically and with a little bit more planning, we can get much better results. Many of our local um, big social pressing issues like health, illness, climate change are all rooted in behaviours. And even small changes to everyday behaviours can bring considerable benefits. Many people that successfully adopt new behaviours fail to maintain them over time. And I think we're all aware of those times that um, we really feel that we're on fire um, and everything's going great. And then we don't understand why six months later it seems so hard to actually eat the same way or carry on getting out of bed and going for that walk in the morning. So if we actually think about what behaviour is, it refers to the action of a living being or system in response to the environment. And it's really easy to see our sheep finding good behaviours in the winter when they know that they're going to get fed. It doesn't take them long to realise the noise of the tractor. And so our goal is to create those new behaviours that will eventually become habits. Now, 40% of our day-to-day -day actions are not conscious decisions, but are actually habits. And so they're a big part of our life. And a lot of the time, we don't even notice that we're doing them. Most people don't remember cleaning their teeth in the morning, tying their shoelaces. There's lots of automatic things that we do that are habits that we don't necessarily um, remember. So our life is, to a large extent, is the sum of all of our habits, both good and bad. And so we can control our life and our behavior a little bit more by changing those habits. Now, if we come to the number of people that can successfully change habits, about 20% of people needing to change an unhealthy behavior are actually prepared to do so at any one time. And only about 5% of those are gonna carry on to be quite successful at actually changing that behavior. So it, it isn't easy. It was back in the 1960s that 21 days was suggested as the time it took to form a new habit of behavior. But when we actually look at um, the science behind that, um, it really wasn't um, based on particularly good science. In 2009, researchers did a far more um, rigorous trial, recruiting people interested in forming a new daily habit, like drinking a glass of water before bed. And the results were hugely varied. Some people might have only taken 18 days, but some people were still hadn't got that extra habit embedded after 254 days. The average it took was 66 days to solidify a new habit. And for a habit to become something we do every day, it needs to become hardwired into your brain. And once it is hardwired into your brain, the 180 days was there because quite often it can take that long to break that wiring. So it's a lot harder to break a habit than it is to form a new one. So our brain forms these neural connections based on what we do repeatedly in our life, both good and bad. So if we're worrying about every little thing, if we're Facebook surfing, if we're picking our nose, these things can all become hardwired. Also, if we're doing better things, if we're doing movement snacks on a daily basis or belly breathing in response to stress, those repeated responses and behaviours are going to start becoming neural traits. So making a break or breaking a habit involves a neuroplastic change in your brain. A person desires something because their brain has become sensitised to the substance and the experience that it craves and it releases a neurotransmitter called dopamine which is the same one that's um, given out when we get addicted to cocaine and lots of other things. But just when we're doing something that makes us feel good, we release dopamine. And not only is it a feel good neurotransmitter in our brain, but that same shot of dopamine also is an essential component of hardwiring that neuroplastic change. So 
really if we're going to change habits we want to make sure they're positive we want to make sure they give us some level of pleasure because in doing that we're actually helping to hardwire them in so the first time we do something that dopamine hit comes after the event and then each time thereafter that dopamine hit will come a little bit earlier to the point that um, if we're doing something really, really regularly, that dopamine hit can actually come while we're just thinking about going out and doing it. And so let's leave willpower on the table. And actually, that dopamine hit's far more motivating to get us out and doing something um, than relying on willpower and, and determination alone. So really getting ourselves to motivate into a new behavior, again, it's got to be pleasurable. So. Each time we act in the same way, that neural pattern is stimulated, becomes strengthened, and the neurons that fire together wire together, and the brain's gonna move as efficiently as it can with the path of least resistance to make sure that, that habit gets um, fired into place. And this is how easily, um, in, you know, in a positive way, getting good habits is in place. In a negative way, this is how full-blown addictions can happen pretty quickly. Change is a process, not an event. So when Nike have suggested that we just do it, well, please don't. If we take um, everybody that makes a New Year's resolution, only about 12% of them are still doing it in February. This isn't six months down the track, this is a month later. So snap decisions on changing a behavior aren't very successful. And I, every time I see just do it, I just think, just don't. This is a much better model to have a look at and think about behavior change. Um, this theoretical model really goes through all the different um, levels of behavior change and shows that we do go up and down in a regular basis. And we start off here with pre-contemplation. This is when your partner tells you that you need to fix something or you need to change and you think, no, I don't. Um, this is when there's something and you really think, well, the change I've got to make is just not worth the goal I'm going to get. You don't really think you've got a problem. Uh, and if you do think you've got a problem, you think that the solution for the problem isn't worth um, going for. So this is the very first stage of, of, of the sort of staircase that we need to go up. Next, we've got contemplation. This for me is the most important one out of everything. So First of all, we're saying, OK, there's something that I'd like to fix. I'd like to get out and move more or uh, I'd like to lose a little bit of weight or I realise that my sleeping's a problem and I might need to really focus on, on trying to get that better. The next part of contemplation, and this is the most important part, I think, that, that gets missed and I will repeat it a couple of times through this talk, is working out why that's going to be important to you. And just like we're all individuals with our own, um, you know, genetic makeup we're all individuals on the things that are going to make us tick and the reasons that we're actually going to be able to make changes in our life and we've got to understand why that's going to work for us so how would losing weight affect you would it mean that you can um do things easier does it mean you're going to have more energy whatever that picture is for you that's what you want to see that's what you should be looking at Next is preparation. There's no point turning around and saying, I'm going to go running tomorrow when you don't even know where your trainers is. You've got to find them at the back of the garage because they haven't been out for two years. And do they still fit? So actually getting prepared, setting a date, making sure you've got all the right things so that your chance of success is dramatically increased is a really important part of the step. And then we get to action. We're trying the new behavior. And normally in the early stages of this, we're feeling really good. Um, when we've done that planning and we understand why we're doing it, quite often we have some really, really good success in this action phase. And if we can keep that going for over six months, then we call it maintenance. And so it's starting to become a bit more habitual. Um, it's starting to become something that we do every day. Now, we're not always going to get to this stage that we become an advocate. We're not always going to get to this stage or termination is another word for it. And so things like cleaning your teeth in the morning, again, those things that are completely automatic that we don't think about, that's becoming an advocate. So say, for example, when people have, say, given up smoking, 
some people are quite comfortable in the fact that they can say now they're a non-smoker and they've got no urge and no desire to ever smoke again. So they've become an advocate or they're in termination. Some people are going to sort of every time they go out think actually I could have a cigarette and it's a constant battle and it's something they need to stay in and sometimes for those people it's going to stay in maintenance for a long time um, before it switches through um, to advocacy if at all. So we don't just want to do it because we're skipping this really important understanding why we want to change and making the proper plans in place to give us the best chance of success. Willpower as well, you know, it's, it's not about being strong and being determined. And some of us have character strengths that naturally lead us a little bit better that way, but lots of us don't. And in fact, self-regulation's normally right down there at the bottom of my list of character strengths. So we really want to come to stuff that we want to do. And I, I've set up this thing I call want goal setting, and it's quite simple, but it just gives us a nice framework for how our goals should be structured. And the first one, as we talked about, it's that why. Why do I want to do this? Why do I want to achieve this goal? Really understanding that's going to give you a much better chance of achieving it. We have to make sure it's achievable. We have to make sure that it's easy, um, that there are easy ways we can start because these things do take time and effort. So we want to know that we can actually um, make that goal a success. And this can be done really by planning is, is the key. It's part of that preparation and part of that planning to make sure you've got the stuff in place. So for example, um, if we're going to turn around and say, I'd like to eat more vegetables every week. Well, at this time of year when it's so cold and if you're out working on the farm, coming in at lunchtime and actually cutting yourself up some carrot sticks is probably the worst thing that you can think about. But we've got a beautiful lamb warm casserole there and actually making that once a week and being able to tuck into that every day when you come in for lunch. It takes five minutes and you're getting two or three serves of vegetables at least at lunchtime. It's probably actually quite an achievable thing. And that gets onto the next point which is it has to be nurturing. It has to make us feel good. And I know that if I'd been out in the cold all morning, what I'd want to be coming into would be something like this. And if I knew that I was getting that extra serve of vegetables that I knew I wanted to bring into my life as well, I know that I'd be doing my body a favor. So I'd be um, feeling that I'm nurturing my body as well as that actual warm food's going to be having a similar effect. And the last thing is we do need to actually track our progress. We do need to see how we're going and whether that's by being aware of how you're feeling and whether you're feeling better after a couple of weeks or whether you're physically actually got a list that you're ticking boxes and showing how many serves of vegetables you've had in a week um, is entirely up to you. But some sort of um, monitor can be very motivating. And this is just another way of looking at that. And this is another way of looking at those rules of behavior change. And again, in the middle, it's knowing the why. That's the most important part. And going back to, we need to make that dopamine happen. So we need to make it fun. If we want to get fitter, don't take up running if you hate running. You know, do a physical activity that you really enjoy. Think about the things that, that you've traditionally enjoyed in the past and make those the things that you try and bring more of into your life. Because we talked about trying to make it as easy as possible. Um, if we're trying to clear junk food out of our life and eat healthier, get it out the pantry. Because it's really unlikely when willpower is lacking that you're going to go and get in the car and drive to your nearest shop to pick up some junk. If you've got a healthier choice in the pantry, that's what you're going to take. Again, if we can set some sort of routine and try and make it a habit, that can work really, really well and trying to do it maybe at a similar time or similar days of the week or um, with a similar cue, that can really, really help cement those behavior changes. Again, we need to be positive. Um, it needs to be about adding good and, and creating good and that um, dopamine response again. That's the thing that's gonna pull us through. And community is the way to cure a hell of a lot of things. And whether that's friends, family, or whether you're going to get professional help to help you achieve your goals, it doesn't matter. But being involved with other people, if you've committed to walking at six o'clock in the morning 
and it's peeing down with rain, if you're meeting somebody at the end of the drive, you will get out of bed and go. If you're not, it takes somebody with quite a lot of resolve to still go and do that. And as we mentioned before, that motivation from tracking and measuring your pro, um, progress can be very, very powerful as far as keeping that motivation going. Don't pursue the wrong goals. And when it, motivating your behavior change comes down to either intrinsic goals, and these are inward goals. These are ones, they're the goods of the soul, they're the personal growth, they're the personal relationships, their physical health, or extrinsic goals. And so this is stemming from the Latin outward. So these relate to worldly goods like money, status, fame. Intrinsic is all about enjoying the journey. They're about going after what's personally meaningful for you. Um, they fuel you as a person and fulfill those core human needs of relatedness, competence, and autonomy. Extrinsic goals are a means to an end. They're all about achieving a certain outcome. We're not that worried about how we get there. It's the goal at the end that's the process. And the classic is that I'll be happy when, I'll be happy when I've lost 10 kilos. I'll be happy when I get the job promotion. I'll be happy when I've got this car, this money. The problem with that is the goal is there. And normally when we're getting close to that goal, we'll find another one. And so we never quite get there. Research shows time and time again that those intrinsic goals enhance a person's happiness, well-being and self-esteem can really add to overall success in life. Whereas people that are pursuing, constantly pursuing those extrinsic goals um, really end up with a lot more mental issues going on and really far more dissatisfied in life in the long term. So an example of this, I guess, for me is um, exercise. Since becoming a health coach, I try and encourage people to get out and exercise at least three or four times a week. Um, so I have an extrinsic goal that if I'm asking uh, my clients to do that, I've got to do that as well. So that's got me out. Over the last couple of years, I've started exercising with a group of ladies that I've had a lot of fun with. We've started going and doing some slightly bigger events and some slightly more challenging events. Um, and we laugh a lot. And so I'm really starting to enjoy my exercise more and getting out there and doing it because I want to be part of that group that's really nurturing my life rather than I just should because I know that's what I should be doing as a health coach. The problem for that is that if I stop being a health coach tomorrow, my motivation for carrying on with that goal is now gone. Whereas those intrinsic goals, they're going to keep going forever, nurturing um, those relationships and that sense of pride and fun that um, I get with my friends. So how to sow the new seeds of behavior and grow new habits and behavior. And the best thing to do is form a new parallel behavior. So for example, if you're feeling stressed, instead of reaching for a bar of chocolate or a beer or a glass of wine, try and make exercise a different habit that you have when you feel stress. It doesn't mean you can't have the beer or the glass of wine, but don't make that the automatic response. Say, well, I can still have that later, but I'm going to go for a run first and see if that helps. So it's creating a new positive habit. And studies have shown that people are 25 times more successful if they cultivate a new habit rather than just resisting the old one. So bringing new things in. Um, so instead of saying, I'm never going to eat junk food, I'm not having any junk food this week, just make sure that you're gonna add lots of vegetables in this week. That should be the new goal. I'm gonna add lots of good food in this week. If you do eat a little bit of junk food, that's fine, but the chances are you'll be fuller from eating all that other stuff. You've created a habit to um, eat better stuff rather than just saying you absolutely can't have that because it can get quite obsessive um, if you're just told you can't have something. So we're better off sort of crowding, crowding out the bad habits with some good habits. Just tackle one thing at a time. Like, you know, we've, we've all got a lot on and we're all busy and actually it's really, really hard to sort of do half a dozen things. And so if you say, well, I'm gonna quit eating junk food, I'm gonna start to exercise and I'm gonna go to bed early. Well, we're setting ourselves up for failure. So just pick one, just pick one and work on that one. And the rest will come in time. But what happens is when you take one thing and you actually start doing that well, 
then you have a slight shift in mindset as well. And you kind of become a person who can achieve change rather than I can't. And that's a really enormous thing. So if you've got a problem that seems really, really big that you're just not quite sure how to tackle, tackle something that's got nowhere near as much emotional um, with it. So uh, say, for example, there's some sort of health issue that's really, really worrying you. And obviously you go and get it investigated, but if you're not quite sure how to tackle it, tackle having some more vegetables or sleep. All of these things are going to help that problem. But rather than tackling that one big thing, tackle a small thing and have a small success there. And it'll show you that you can really, really make some changes um, and encourage you to open up for those new ones. As we talked, repeating that behavior often, um, try and get it wired in 66 days on and that's on average so some of us are lucky enough for it to be less but for lots of us it's going to take longer and there's a big movement now for tiny goals so start really really small if we haven't got time to do something else you know do one press up plus one tooth i know it seems ridiculous read one chapter of a book i know it seems ridiculous but if we can find the time to do the action just once very soon you'll actually be flossing all your teeth or you'll have gone to five or ten press-ups a day or you'll be able to sit down and give yourself five minutes to read two or three pages of the book but by starting small we're actually getting the action of the behavior we're starting to get our body used to that and then you can just expand the time and realize that you can um, actually put another minute or two onto that So this is a decisional balance worksheet and I'll pop this, um, a copy of this if anybody wants to download it onto um, my Facebook page. And this is a really good tool if you're not sure whether to go ahead with a behavior change or whether it's worth it. And just to give you some clarity around what that behavior change would actually make. So we sit down first and we look at what's gonna happen if I don't change the behavior. What are the benefits of staying the same? Well, very often it doesn't require any effort. Uh, you end up with more free time. You just stay as you are. People often use um, problem items to de-stress. The things we need to get rid of are often being used for something else in our life. And the reasons to change, well, we are gonna feel better ourselves if we're having some more positive behaviors. We are likely to get more energy and better mood. We are likely to feel that we've got a bit more control over what we're doing. We're gonna get support from family and friends and hopefully get improved health and possibly finances depending on the changes we're making. And what are our concerns about staying the same and not changing? Well, maybe your health's gonna deteriorate um, and there's an economic cost with that and the chance of being a burden with that. We also, when we don't change our behavior, we end up with quite a narrow and fixed mindset. And this can end up making us feel quite isolated and give us quite a lot of low confidence. And we can't really see lots of room for opportunity for change. What are the problems with changing the behavior? Well, you know, there aren't many behavior changes that aren't going to require some effort and aren't going to probably be a bit hard at some times. So, these things take time, you know, invariably, and time seem, is something that a lot of us are poor in. There's usually a cost. We usually, um, definitely eating well costs, costs more than, um, than if we ate a whole heap of packet food. And if we're um, starting a new hobby, all these things tend to cost. And the fear of failure, you know, well, am, am I gonna be able to do it? So with that, um, worksheet it's worth just looking at all the different lifestyle factors again and again like we said before just pick one just start in one place so whether it is like we talked about an extra serve of vegetables um whether you start box breathing when you become aware that you're feeling a bit stressed that's a much better response than grabbing the the, the beer or the wine um sleep uh the movement snacks that laura's gone through us you know actually actively making sure they're a part of every day um just going through those but again just pick one thing that you'd like to focus on and make that and, and get that rolling before then you try another one just to conclude here 
the message I really want you to take away is you're much more likely to make these changes when the new behaviours are associated with positive emotions. You've got to enjoy it. It's got to be fun. And that positive reinforcement really allows our mind to open and grow and we get a little bit creative and open to new things. And then we can really start making a difference in our lives in ways that when we get a little bit stuck in a rut, we really can't see. So again, it's just becoming that I can person. And if you can do it on a couple of small things, it can really snowball and have a really big effect then on lots of other areas of life that you would never normally imagine could be related. But it's amazing how quickly these things can snowball. When it comes to gut health, the bacteria in our gut can be one of the strongest allies in getting healthy or one of our worst enemies. Most people don't realize it, but what they eat and how they live are changing the makeup of their gut bacteria. So all diseases begin in the gut. This isn't new. This is two and a half thousand years old. Hippocrates, the father of medicine. And we're eventually coming back full circle and realizing that there's a hell of a lot of truth in this. Exciting new studies are coming out every day, exploring the connections between gut bacteria and practi e practically every other aspect of both human and animal health. The conclusion is clear. If, if we change our gut, we can change our life. But how do we know if something's wrong? And more importantly, what can we do about it? So what is the microbiome? Well, it's often considered to be an acquired organ. In fact, people are actually um, wanting to call it the, the next major organ of the body um, because of its enormous influence that it has on our health. Again, like our fingerprints and like our genes, we've each got a unique composition of um, bugs that live in our tummies and tens of trillions of bacteria. We've got 10 times more cells um, in our gut bacteria than there are in our body itself. And 150 times more genes than we've got in our own genetic material. And this group of bacteria that lives in us can weigh up to two kgs. And so it's a fairly substantial um, part of, of our intestines and, and how we're living. And there's over a thousand different types of um, bacteria that have been identified. But normally um, when we get it tested, and yes, you do get it tested how you'd imagine, they just actually look in your poo, is 150 to 170 in any one person. So if we actually look at what's happening inside the gastrointestinal tract, food passes from the stomach and goes into the small intestine. Now the small intestine is called small because it's narrow, but it is actually around six meters long, all crammed in there in our stomach. And then it moves then into the large intestine, which is again called large because it's wider, but that's only about 1.5 meters, but even so, We've got seven to eight meters of intestines if we laid it all out. Now inside that intestine wall, there's lots of folds and on the folds, there's lots of little villi that make more folds and these are the villi. And then we've got one layer of cells and that's it. That's, that's what separates this one layer of cells that's got lots of little villi on here. And this is where all the bacteria live and this is their home. And this is what separates us from the outside world. That's it. This one little cell is what's separating everything that goes into our system, um, into a, in through our mouth, from going into our bodies. And so it has a really, really important job. Now, if we actually laid out the whole of um, those cells, they'd form the size of a tennis court. So our 2 kgs of bacteria has got quite a lot of job to do to protect something that's got that big a surface area. And not all gut bacteria created equal. We all know what it's like when we get a really bad tummy upset and how bad it is for our digestion. So it's our good bugs that can help counteract that, counteract that, improve the digestion. They're obviously really important with our immunity and not just because they're helping to make a barrier from the outside world, but also because they're helping to produce, um, produce um, antibodies and materials that are gonna fight foreign bodies. They're really important in the manufacture of um, quite a few crucial vitamins and actually absorbing nutrients from our food. 
And really surprisingly, 90% of the serotonin, which is a happy um, neurotransmitter or happy hormone, and a lot of our dopamine, again, our pleasure um, hormone, is actually made in the gut. So there's a really, really big gut correlation then between actual gut health and things like depression and anxiety. Other things bad bugs can lead to are poor skin conditions. And obviously, if we haven't got the good bugs actually making sure the vitamins and minerals are working properly, and we've got ones that are stopping it, we end up with that sort of nutrition balance going on in our bodies. And this is what happens at that cell level when we cut, and we've heard about leaky gut, we hear lots in the news about leaky gut, but this is actually what's happening. So we've got these cells, they've got these lovely little tight boundaries and the bacteria are all living around here doing their job. They're making sure these nutrients are coming through to our blood. We've got a lovely healthy immune system waiting just in case anything comes in. And in here, we've got our large food particles that still need broken down and our pathogens that we really don't want to get in there. And they're being held out really well. And then anything from antibiotics to poor diet to infections to some medications can then lead to holes in the gut. And this is leaky gut is literally what you think. It's a, it's a hole in the gut. And because that hole gets big enough, small portions of food can come in. The pathogens can come in. Our body then sets up a response here with antibodies to try and stop, you know, that infection. And that's what leads to inflammation in our system. And this can be a really, really big player in things like autoimmune diseases. So you'll also see here that when this happens, the villi aren't as lovely. We're not holding the nutrients in them. And so getting those nutrients into the system is also compromised. And the main causes of leaky gut, well, food, definitely gluten and dairy can be quite, um, quite reactive. But again, if you know when you eat something, you feel really bloated, you have quite a strong reaction, you'll appreciate that food might be something that's not reacting with you. Again, we're all individuals and we all have different weak links um, and different things that are gonna make those causes. Um, small, intestinal, small intestine bacterial overgrowth is getting much, much, much more prevalent. This is where we have far too many bad bacteria growing in our small intestine. A lot of that seems to be after things like um, using too many antacids and things like this. And we're altering the pH um, in our stomach, which is then leading to a change in our small intestine. And that can lead to quite a lot of problems down the track. Certainly medications. Obviously, antibiotics are really crucial at doing the job they do, which is killing bad bacteria that are making us sick. But they're pretty widespread and they kill a lot of bacteria. So we have to be aware after we've been on antibiotics that we really want to be promoting gut healing again and having lots and lots of really um, gut promoting foods to try and make sure that we're getting that, that level of bacteria back up. And things like pesticides, things like plastics can all play a part. And stress, here we come back again, stress has an enormous effect on creating leaky gut. And whether that's emotional or physical, we just need to be really aware that all of these things can all go and compromise, compromise our gut. So we've got signs here that you've got a leaky gut and we're gonna run through them just really quickly. So you may have digestive issues. Um, you know, we talked about you know, having gas and bloating, food allergies, brain fog or difficulty concentrating, lots of mood imbalances or skin issues, Seasonal allergies or asthma, um, especially for ladies, lots of hormonal imbalances. And then the autoimmune diseases such as arthritis, Hashimoto's, um, and the most well known, I guess, to do with gut is celiac disease. And lastly, um, chronic fatigue often has a huge um, correlation to leaky gut. And very topical at the moment, but at least 70% of our immune system exists in our gut. So this is another really, really important part to make sure that it's as healthy as possible. And all these lovely bugs that live within us are going to be living in the best way they can, because at the moment, more than any time in, in our history that we've been aware of, you know, we really need to keep our immune system as strong as possible. If we do have leaky gut, um, there's quite a, 
this is quite a standardized response to overcoming it. There are certainly anything you can do that's going to make your gut more healthy, um, you can do, but if you have got really, really strong issues, actually going through things in this order is definitely going to um, be the best way for you. And so we go through, they're called the five R's, and so we remove things. So this is often something like an elimination diet. So normally you um, take high, highly allergic foods like gluten, dairy, um, very often eggs, and um, some meats are taken out as well as nuts. And it's a fairly limited diet, but you only do it for two or three weeks and just give your gut a chance to heal. And then you gradually reintroduce foods. Um, and then you can see as you're reintroducing them if you have a reaction from them. Also, we want to remove the environmental toxins out of our life and eliminate stress. Next, we start to replace them. Now, if we have had a really bad case, it is worth going and spending some time either with a nutritionist or a naturopath to make sure you're getting a really good um, mix of digestive enzymes to actually help really properly help that digestion get back to normal. And next we need to re-inoculate. And so that's helping the bacteria, the good bacteria you've got there flourish, um, giving them prebiotic foods and taking probiotic foods, which are full of more good bacteria or a probiotic supplement, which again, you could be um, given from a naturopath or a nutritionist. Um, so we're actually getting far more good bacteria back into the system to start doing the job it's supposed to do. There are certain nutrients that are really, really good at helping repair the gut lining and things like glutamine, which come from all our beautiful meats, um, and especially blown broth when we actually start making stuff out of the bones as well. It's really like gold, um, vitamin D and really, really good, healthy fats. And lastly, again, we're coming back to those lifestyle factors. Unless we get those lifestyle factors under control and we're rebalancing our life, um, the leaky gut's going to come back. So we need to focus on, on really making sure that we've got those things, that sleep, exercise and stress that all have an effect on the GI tract. And we hear lots about probiotics and prebiotics and it can all get quite confusing, but essentially probiotics are the bugs. Um, they're the good ones that we want to put in. And so you can either get them in a pill form, uh, but out of food, yogurt, kefir, sauerkraut, stuff that we're fermenting at home, um, the kombuchas, they're all really, really good things that we can make with probiotics in them. Now, prebiotics, these are usually foods with lots of fiber. And these are, this is the stuff that actually feeds the bugs. So um, things like leeks, onion, dandelion greens, and you can literally just pick them off your garden, preferably if you haven't got 100 dogs. Um, Jerusalem artichoke, legumes. Now, chicory root is another really, really amazing prebiotic. Uh, we don't can't really get it in the supermarket but you can make coffee out of it you can get it from health food stocks in a, in a coffee kind of format and just interestingly with things like that we're eating every day like potatoes pasta and rice um, if we actually cook them and then let them cool they get much higher in resistant starch well it's that resistant starch that's beautiful prebiotic food and even when we reheat them Although they, they lose a little bit of that resistant starch, they've still got significantly more than when they've been cooked the first time. So please, when you're cooking your potatoes or having had pasta salad or rice salad for lunch the next day, because it's really high in prebiotics, um, once it's been cooled, it forms this um, wonderful starch that, that, yeah, our bugs love. And these are, again, I mean, I've just mentioned them, but making your own kombucha and sauerkrauts, they, you don't need to spend $20 from them from health food shops. They are relatively easy to make at home. They're very cost effective. And when it comes to bone broth, it really is um, a really magical gut healing food. Our grandparents didn't give you chicken soup when you were sick for um, no reason. And if you're making your own bone broth, so chickens, I, I like to make it in the slow cooker in the garage because it does kind of stink the house out a wee bit. Um, so every time we have a chicken, I'll freeze the carcass until I've got four or five. And you cook that for about 24 to 48 hours. But if you can get your beautiful bones um, 
from your lamb, from your beef, a real mixture of ones with bone marrow, ones with um, joints. You want a real mixture of all different bones and you really want to be cooking them for about 48 hours, just with a little bit of apple cider vinegar and then whatever leftover veggies and bits and pieces you've got out the fridge. And then it makes the most wonderful base. You can either drink it on its own or use it for a stock or for gravy or for soups. And you can freeze it in batches if you can make a nice big lot. But it's, it's all, for the last two and a half thousand years, it's been an amazing digest, digestive tonic. And it's something that's so easy for us all to make, but can have such enormous health benefits. It's just worth having it on, on tap if you can. And there's lots of different um, microbiomes that are now being investigated across the whole of the world. Obviously, we're really interested in what's going on in our soil and the bacterial content of our soil has a big influence on growth. Um, in Europe, they've actually shown that farmhouses, the dust and the bugs in the dust are actually much better for you than they are in urban areas. And they've repeated these studies in Finland and then again in Germany, that kids that grow up in farmhouses um, there and it's got quite a specific, uh, specifically different set of microbiomes in the dust in the house, have far less asthma than the ones growing up in urban areas and that bacterial content of the dust is quite, quite different. And when we're getting new animals, actually getting them feeding within the first six hours, that colostrum that comes first out um, is about 40% probiotic it's hugely important and if you're feeding cattle within the first six hours rather than after six hours they've shown that their gut colony is dramatically increased compared to ones that have been left for more than six hours before they're fed it so actually getting that stuff in earlier can have a much better effect at getting those bugs into the gut of, of, of your um, animals nice and early so just to summarize for that um everyday things we can do for a healthy gut Obviously eat those gut healing foods, but it is important to reduce stress and keep up the exercise and reduce the toxic load and increase the sleep. And again, we're just coming back to actually looking at lifestyle factors and making sure that those lifestyle factors, you know, we are conscious of them. And whilst it's quite a big list, again, going back to the behavior change, just start with one thing, you know, and if your one thing is I'm gonna make bone broth next month, then that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good way to start.